I think we're in a period of correction uh, where we have to snap back from some of the delusional thinking that, that, that we got involved in. Question is, and then what? John Elkington is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. John Elkington is a world authority on corporate responsibility, sustainable capitalism, a best-selling author, and serial entrepreneur. John is founder and chief pollinator at Volans, which works with leaders to make sense of the emergent future to unlock tomorrow's market value. Volans tackles some of the world's most challenging problems, helping key actors expand their focus from the responsibility agenda through resilience to regeneration. Much of the work is at board or C-suite level. John's thought leadership is evident in ongoing in Volans inquiries, including Project Breakthrough, Tomorrow's Capitalism Inquiry, and the Green Swans Observatory. John has helped create and incubate movements, including the Global Sustainability Movement, and powerfully shaped initiatives like the Dow Jones Sustainability Indexes, the Global Reporting Initiative, and B-Lab UK. He was a faculty member of the World Economic Forum from 2002 to 2008, and in 2009, he was named fourth in an international survey, Top 100 Corporate Social Responsibility Leaders after Al Gore, Barack Obama, and the late Anita Rodick. John has addressed over thousands of conferences globally and served on over 80 boards and advisory boards. He is the author or co-author of over 20 books, the latest being Green Swans, The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism. I've got your book here. It's one of my favorite. I recommend it all the time, John. This is one of the most amazing books uh, of our decade and probably our century. I thank you very much for it. We, we've talked in other forms, uh, Future IO Institute, we talked about your book before. Um, and I really welcome you and thank you for your time that we can finally meet and have this podcast. Mark, thanks very much for the invitation, uh, firstly. Secondly, when you introduced me, it sounded almost like I was listening to my obituary uh, strolling, strolling down. And, and, and actually, to be honest, I feel that I'm only just getting started. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get into some of that uh, in a moment. But again, looking forward to the conversation. Well, I, I'm amazed because uh, it, and I hope it's, it's okay for me to mention your age. You're, you're getting into 72 now, right? I'm 73 in June, so I'm told. 73 in June, yeah. So um, instead of birthday celebrations, you're having these uh, birthday celebration events on regeneration and doing amazing things. And when I look at you, when I uh, hear that, you know, you were on a meeting before our podcast, that you just have this insatiable drive uh, to keep going. Is that because you don't see it as work because it's this movement, this mission? Where do you get that? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, it's odd because I think my father had uh, was just a human dynamo and he ran pretty continuously until he died about three years ago and my mother died the same year and they were both in their very late 90s um so i think there's some sort of genetic component to it but also i i, I grew up with the environmental movement first and um i've always found anything to do with the uh wider environment absolutely fascinating so it's been a constant set of uh, learning curves then i got into sustainability then i got into everything and throughout work with business. And if, if, if you're working with agendas like that and, uh, and uh, a world like the business world, which is everything, it's economics, it's technology, it's people uh, in combinations and so on, it's absolutely fascinating. So I, I, I think to, to your point, I don't think it has totally been work uh, to me. And if, I, if I'm not writing a book, then I need to be writing uh, something else. So it's, it's um, this, yeah, it, it, it I, I find it hard to account for, but I'm I'm sort of quite pleased it's worked that way to date. So 
right after Green Swans came out in 2020, you uh, received in 2021, uh, last year, the World Sustainability Award. Unbelievable. And that just goes to what you say, this drive and, and um, to, to do this work, to speak, to write and talk about these things. I, I want to write out the gate, talk about the triple bottom line recall. Um, mm -hmm. For those on the call who've never heard about the triple bottom line, you came out with it. Um, I, what is it? 29 years ago now, almost, right? 1994, yes. 1994. And then you recalled it in 2018. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that. And then I want to uh, ex maybe explain for, for some of those individuals how to look at a re recall. Is it similar to a product recall that we, that we see out there? And uh, for those who still have it in their models and who are still talking about the triple bottom line, how do we make sure that they have the recrawl product or the new version of that, that mentality? Mm -hmm. and, and where yeah. are you going with that? Well, it, it turns out to be easier to recall something and create the shockwaves that go with that, which I did with um, the product recall in this case for the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit, uh, as you said, in 2018. Um, it's not quite so easy to then reintroduce the, 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 the new version, although we have been doing that. And, and the book that you just kindly brandished, uh, Mark, is, is um, part of the... the um, the answer to the question, if not that, then what? But I, the, the, the idea of the product recall, and I'll come on to the, 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 the history that built up to it, was not that we were sticking the idea of the triple bottom line on the spike. I mean, we couldn't, how dare we, in a way. I mean, it had, it had got a life of its own. Uh, now there's something over 4,000 uh, B corporations around the world who are chartered around uh, versions of the, the triple bottom line. And you mentioned the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, it's a global reporting initiative. All of these different initiatives have had the triple bottom line at their core. But the original idea, the original intent uh, when I launched it in 1994 was we needed system change. Uh, and capitalism, as it was currently configured, was not delivering the forms of value uh, that we needed. In fact, it was actually very often. Uh, destroying critical forms of value, particularly natural capital. So um, the idea was that, that the triple bottom line would help people think. And I have to say for the first couple of years, it was difficult. I mean, even in my own company then called Sustainability, which we'd set up in 1987, when I came up with the triple bottom line, uh, one of my key colleagues, still a great friend, he was also a co-founder of um, Follance back in 2008. Uh, and I worked with him for well over 20 years. And he basically said, I didn't join um, a, a, an organization that was doing uh, all of this economic and social stuff. I wanted to do environment because that felt to me the most important um, agenda. And it, it took me 18 months to take him through a process where he, at the end, he thought, actually, now I see why you're doing it. It's not against environment and it's not um, in replacement for it. It's, it, it. it is actually a way of addressing the environmental challenges that we have. And then out of the blue, I mean, pretty much, um, uh, a very major company, Shell, came to us and said, we want to embrace the triple bottom line. We want to do a, um, a, the first report on all of that. Uh, this was the dawn of sustainability reporting. Uh, they actually used, without consulting us, the um, the phrase that I come up with, people, planet, and profit, that was in 1995. So, I mean, a huge amount of activity had happened, but the problem was, at least in my mind, the problem was that when I looked at what companies were doing, businesses were doing, very often what they were doing was trading off different aspects of the, the triple bottom line agenda. So, you know, it, they'd say, we're doing the economic, economic bit because we, we're making a profit tick. Well, the whole point about the economic thing is it's much wider than the financial performance agenda, but let's leave that for the moment. Then social, oh, we're doing that. We, we, we provide jobs. We, we give people products and services they need. You know, again, tick. It's a shame about the environment. Or it might be, you know, we're doing really well on the financial and the, uh, the, the, the environmental side. We're, we're, we're saving and making money by doing the right thing environmentally. Shame about the 
social side. Now you might see Walmart with you know its its, its work on energy efficiency and uh, as, as sort of some sort of solution to the climate crisis as as an example of a company that's been gone stronger on the green and, and the sort of financial side than it has sometimes perhaps on the the social side, like sort of uh, social conditions of labor and, and things like that. Um, so to, to your question about um, replacing the original idea, um, in every opportunity that we get, we talk about why we think the triple bottom line was flawed, why we think it, it remains, uh, 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 you know, I think despite the fact I'm saying it myself, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a very useful idea and it won't disappear. Um, but it needs to be thought in a slightly different way. Um, uh, and so that's what we're trying to explain. Thank you for explaining that. And as a, 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 really, a lot of people are still, even though it's, you know, 28, 29 years ago now with the triple bottom line, still kind of hearing about it, realizing, oh, there's something that sounds pretty good. And whether they're a startup and they're, they're starting it, I want to kind of ask a, a couple of questions. So, you, you went in that expo, in that explanation you basically said that you know shell came out they didn't really ask for full approval they started using it and you started seeing companies not only shell but others using the triple bonding bottom line in kind of this the skewed way i know you've done a lot of work with the world business council for sustainable development un global compact other international business related uh environmental pushes um was it was it also a little bit that frustration behind the scenes that you're seeing these organizations talk or use that and just not the way that you originally attended? Is that also kind of that nudged you or kind of led into that that, that recall as well? Well, I'm, I'm going to say something that will get me into a lot of hot water, but um, I, I imagine that Jesus or Confucius or Muhammad or whatever got frustrated because their followers who were normal people uh, bent whatever they were hearing to uh, whatever they wanted uh, to yeah. hear or what they wanted to do. So, I mean, there's nothing unusual about a new idea being to some degree distorted in, in, in use. And, and I've always said that if, if something is going to go mainstream, then necessarily it dilutes because something everyone is talking about, it, everyone is thinking about it, and they're all just taking their own little bits sort of in, in, in their own um, direction. So it wasn't any sort of surprise, but I think what, what had happened during the 20 some years um, uh, since the idea was first launched was that the scale of the challenges that we face and the evidence, the scientific evidence that we were seeing on things like the climate emergency and biodiversity and the, all of these different things was becoming so pressing that what I was prepared to put up with in terms of, well, you know, it's a bit like, a bit like a teacher with students. They're not quite getting the whole story, but enough of it, they're getting enough of it to pass the exam. So let's, let's leave them to it. It just, it, it started to feel wrong. Uh, in, in, in key elements, that so people were thinking that they were saving the world when they weren't, uh, and they was um, they were thinking that when they had very little chance of uh, doing things that would properly save uh, the planetary um, systems that we all depend upon. So uh, the the odd thing was, I, I I didn't come at it with a very deep, well articulated view as to exactly why the thing was wrong exactly how it needed to be repaired and, and, and time scales or whatever. I just, I did it. The Harvard Business Review said it was the first time any management concept in their knowledge had been uh, recalled. And I was quite lucky because with a few exceptions, uh, the response was overwhelmingly positive, but people did ask, and then, and then what? what? If not that, then, as I said earlier on, what? And for me, the, the point I got to uh, was that I'm going to do something really glib and it's going to sound like a management consultant and I apologize for it. But the three P's, people, planet and profit, which I came up with in 95, that was a way of trying to make the triple bottom line a little bit more accessible to people. Now, if you if you take the three P's and you just step up one letter in each case, you get three R's. And for me, uh, those three R's are responsibility, which is where most people um, uh, who were practitioners on sustainability, triple bottom line, all of this good stuff, 
they would focus on responsibility. How can our company and its supply chain and its you know, value web and all the rest of it become nicer, better, more transparent, more accountable, engage more of its stakeholders, all of that good stuff. What the business round table in the United States tends to call now stakeholder capitalism. Well, that was a very contested uh, term when I first started to use it back in the early 90s. Um, so responsibility is fine. We've got to do that. And, and the responsibility agenda keeps expanding. But the problem is that all of that good effort is not properly addressing the nature and scale of the problems that we now face. And, and that goes to soils loss, it goes to bleaching of coral reefs, but most conspicuously, it's the fires, the droughts, the storms, the, you know, the floods that are coming with, with um, uh, climate change. And, and particularly now you look at both the, the, the North Pole, which at times has actually literally been on fire. And you look at the Eastern Antarctic uh, where temperatures are now somewhere between 50 and 90 degrees beyond where they would normally be. This is outrageous. This, we've never seen this in recorded uh, history. So it, it's in that sort of context that I was thinking that the way that the triple bottom line is currently being practiced is not improving the resilience of the systems on which we depend. So our economies, our societies, our politics, our biosphere, the environment, they're all wobbling in a different way. And they're all starting to wobble in a slightly integrated way. So in, in a way, I think that the war in uh, Ukraine is one part of that bigger sort of in accelerating disassembly of an old world order. And then the question is, well, if, if your systems are losing their resilience, what do you do? Well, some people might feel you can just get down on your knees and pray or, or you know, just hope. Um, I don't, I think you've got to invest in all of those systems. You've got to restore them. You've got to regenerate them. And that's where the regeneration element of the story came from. So it's responsibility uh, is not enough to stop the resiliency problems that we now face. And you've got to regenerate all of those systems that we depend on in order to, to um, produce long-term system health. That, in, you know, as simply as I can state it, is where we got to with the triple bottom line. And if within that uh, framework, those three, three, three sort of... Um, uh, frames in a way um you, you continue to part of the endless re-imperatives you know there's yep. the, the the endless re-imperatives uh repeat recycle reuse uh responsibility resilience regeneration you know they, they go on but those three responsibility re resilience and regeneration are fabulous I've, I've heard you say before so i'm glad you you brought that out mm -hmm. The other thing is in the book, it's really on the cover, it says uh, um, the coming boom in regenerative capitalism. So, um, which is, is really inter interesting for me and I need your explanation in it. So you already tickle uh, the third R uh, and regeneration on the cover, but in, as well as in the recall, you're, the green swans is addressing kind of what, how, how are we looking at that? What are the, some of the tools? How can we make this product? Yeah. We're not removing it. We're not getting rid of it. We're kind of saying, hey, there's a, a way we can fix it or do it better, or understand the world a little bit more with uh, this experience that we had, that it's not just an accounting principle, surely on profits and the other two aspects totally get overlooked. Um, how do you define that regenerative capitalism and what, what does that look like? How, how do you get, can you explain that a little bit more to us? Well, I can try. Um, and, and it's, it's not uncontentious in the sense that, uh, I, I was trying to be slightly provocative when I put regenerative and capitalism together. And one of my great friends, um, Paul Hawkin, who subsequently did a book called Regeneration, he was already working on it when, I asked him the question, I asked whether, whether he would put um, a, an endorsement on the cover of my book. And he said no, because he, he didn't like the capitalism focus. You know, a lot of people are much more comfortable talking about a regenerative economy or regenerative business or something with sort of less hard edges. But I actually think that unless and until we can properly make 
capitalism regenerative, this isn't going to work. Uh, and when I talk about capitalism, I'm not, as most people would assume, uh, talking about financial capitalism only or physical capital. I'm also talking about social capitalism, um, human capital, uh, natural capital, intellectual capital, all of these different forms. And within each of those, there can be individual regenerative strategies. But equally, if you do it uh, particularly well, you can actually do things like, for example, if, you, if you're regenerating a city, and part of what you're doing is re uh, rebuilding the physical infrastructure, but you're putting in uh, educational systems, you're putting in natural environments, which, which help sort of sponge up floods and clean up the air and things like that. You're creating a system which is, which is regenerative in multiple dimensions. And that is, I think, what we've increasingly got to do. In fact, you kindly uh, uh, mentioned that I just come off a call and the call was with uh, a very major infrastructure company, uh, which is working on uh, becoming regenerative by design. Uh, they're, they're, they're a Spanish company called Ationa. But the context in which we were talking was a pretty brand new course on regenerative economics, which the Capital Institute, John Fullerton and his colleagues uh, are developing now. And in the first, first cohort, I guess it's, it's over eight weeks, uh, over 250 people uh, signed up. And this is I mean, there's a fee to join. Um, and that, to me, is an indication of the way in which uh, this sort of regenerative change agenda is starting to um, find its feet in a way. And it's not just now Walmart announcing it's going to become a regenerative company, believe it or not. But I mean, I, um, Paul Hawken has helped Doug McMillan, the CEO there, with think all of that through, or PepsiCo, or Unilever. All these different companies are now sort of wanting to go in this direction because they feel in their bones that this is the next big thing. They don't always know how to do it. And it's often easier to do in an area like farming than it might be in transportation, for example, but it's coming. Definitely is. And, and I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Before we go too far off that, I just want, you know, Nestle was another company and, and Paul Hawken even talks about yeah. Nestle as well. Pantagonia and many others who are kind of using this regeneration. Uh, as an economic model, as a model in general for their organization to, to restore, to regenerate, to have responsibility, to have that built-in re resilience as well. Um, it's, it's a drastic step, and you say it many times over, that it's a big step away from Friedman's notion of the single bottom line and into something that's I mean, totally different. You, I think the term you always use is he'd turn over in his grave if he knew what we're, what we're doing. Well, in, in, in a way, people talk about shooting fish in a barrel. And if you're, if you're shooting at economists who happen to be dead and you know, whose peak period was a long time ago, you're probably going to score some hits. But I think Friedman was a, 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 an extremely intelligent man. I mean, he was in many ways a genius. And I do not believe that he, if he were brought back alive and kicking in today's world, he would either leave his original idea unmodified or accept uh, the views of some of his uh, more rabid uh, uh, disciples. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware that in using a word like rabid, I'm, I'm being pejorative about people. But I mean, these people have run riot with the global economy, the neoliberals and so on. And they've largely run us off the uh, rails. Um, so I think we're in a period of correction uh, where we have to snap back from some of the delusional thinking that, that, that we got involved in. Question is, and then what? Because the one thing that the uh, Montpellier Society, I mean, the, the, the neoliberals had 50 years ago and some was what they called the brick, which is a 3000 page uh, plan for what you you would do if you were taking a national economy and turning it on onto sort of neoliberal rails. We don't have that brick uh, for the sort of sustainable, uh, climate friendly, regenerative, whatever it is, future uh, that we. So we're happy to talk about the stuff, but not yet to sort of make it absolutely inevitable that the track of history goes in, in, in the right direction. But that's what we've now got to do. And we've got to bring together very much um, 
uh, greater levels of political and economic critical mass if we're going to really move this one forward. Now, you tickled upon it a little bit, uh, and I'm glad you did because it's, it's one of my follow-up questions as well. It's really besides the Green Swans book and the Green Swans Observatory and kind of creating your own sense of regenerators within uh, the observatory and the, kind of the, the, the group or movement that's growing around Volans and, and Green Swans book and, and, and things that you've created, you're also working with the world's best minds and leaders out there around regenerative economies, regeneration, and doing a few courses. One, the one that you mentioned was through the Capital Institute and John Fullerton, and it's a course on regenerative economics. Uh, I just want to read a couple of the people that uh, are included in this. Paul Hawken, Jeremy Lent, uh, who was also on my podcast. Uh, Louise, who is the, your CEO of um, Volans. Hunter Lovins, Allery Sabin, Laura Storm, who wrote the book Regenerative Leadership, Daniel Christian Wall from Designing Regenerative Cultures, I believe, or yeah, is the book he wrote. Uh, Yunka uh, Caporta, Janine Bennis of the Biomimicry uh, Movement and Organizations, 3.8 3. Uh, billion years of biomimicry. And um, it's amazing. I am so glad it's there. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that these courses would be well accepted and people would be jumping on them in droves, regardless of the price that's been charging, because the level of content, the level of the people who, and I've only named a few of them who are in these courses is unbelievable. But I would like you to kind of, um, in the guise of a, of a separate question that comes up a little bit more often. Tell us about these courses and and your role and, and what the bigger picture is on, on your contributions of these course. Because in this day and age, and even since 2015, since the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, we have been bombarded with donut economics, circular economy, planetary mm -hmm. boundaries, uh, mission economics, um, uh, ecological uh, footprint, you know, on and on these different type of economic models. And do they all belong together? Are they all part of a regenerative economic model? And which one's right? Is it, re you know, regenerative economics or is circular economy part of regenerative economics? And how do we understand now these are the good movements of economic models not the bad ones that you just talked about or the bad actors uh, that are out there, but can you tell us a little bit more about those and how we make that bigger understanding of those? That's, that's a big set of questions, Mark. And, yeah. and the one thing I want to make absolutely clear right from the start is that in no way are we trying to push um, a particular prescription against everyone else's particular prescriptions. Uh, so, I mean, in a way, for me, a green swan might well be the expression of circular economics. It might be an expression of you know, the donut. It might be of, of shared value, of di different of biomimicry, different elements of all of this. Um, so in, in, in a way, what we're talking about, the dynamics within which new ideas, new concepts, new frameworks, and so on, new technologies uh, in, in the soft sense of technology, uh, evolve and, 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 and then become implemented. I think one of the things that is a problem for our entire field is that we've grown up in an era of resource starvation, where everyone had to be you know, fighting for their own corner and their own branding and, 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 and so on, which is one of the reasons why we've got so many different terms. But at the same time, uh, I think it's going to get worse, uh, because now the mainstream has woken up uh, to this whole space, and you've got the very big consulting companies, you've got big research institutes, you've got big financial institutions, you, you name it, they're, they're, they're all coming into this space now. They will all want to some degree to have their own language and their own um, uh, frameworks in a way. Uh, so I don't think this muddle is going to sort of resolve itself 
anytime soon. But at the same time, I think we need genuine uh, openness from people in every one of these sort of sometimes armed camps um, to accept that you know what they're doing uh, is not the complete answer to all the problems that we face. Um, but at the same time, we've got to acknowledge that even some of the the camps that have been most intensely sort of uh, held, I, I think about you know the circular economy space, long history. I mean, it goes back fifty years, even hundreds of years, in in Silesia and places like that in Europe, where people developed circular economies, but they didn't have the particular branding that Ellen MacArthur came up with. But to be to be generous with um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, they've done great work. They've really got the circular economy onto the agenda. And they've always had regeneration in the mix somewhere. So <laughs> we're, we're talking about a, a component of what is already part of some other people's um, work. And then you think about um, uh, organic farming and things like that. Regeneration has already been to some degree part of uh, that world. So it, it, it's, um, it's a bit like music where, you know, I, I, I grew up in the 60s when, when there were endless bands and I, it was just a joy because they were always competing with each other and coming up with new uh, ideas. Um, and, and that's where we are, I think, at the moment where, where people are competing, bouncing things off each other. And that, that, that in terms of evolution is really interesting because things evolve very rapidly. But in terms of dissemination and scale and all the rest of it, it's not that great because you know you, you, rock and roll remains a, in this particular metaphor a sort of a trapped somewhere and, and and it doesn't actually take over the world. In its case, it did. Um, so I, I think we've really got to firstly work together uh, much more closely across these different uh, sort of sub movements. We've really got to. Um, uh, uh, understand what others are saying. So for example, one of the things that we've done, uh, Valance is a very small organization by design. Um, we want to be catalytic. We don't want to do everything ourselves. Uh, so um, we're putting our entire team through the Capital Institute course. Uh, and then in May, we're taking the whole team. You mentioned Daniel Wow. Uh, we're gonna spend uh, a weekend um, with him, again, with much of the team, including a couple of people just joining us, um, to just work some, some of this stuff through, because we all have to go up learning curves. Uh, we all have to, to some degree, re-educate uh, ourselves. And that, that, that's, that's part of what we're uh, trying to do. So very much in the spirit of a rising um, tide floating many different ships, but a very strong sense uh, that, that those ships are going to have to come together into an armada of some sort if they're going to do anything useful. Absolutely love that. And, and uh, so I know Daniel Christian Wall, he's done a lot for Gaia education as well and some, yeah. some instruction and training in many different places, so Schumacher College and, and uh, fabulous books. And so, uh, boy, that's going to be a nice, nice training. Um, as I mentioned as well, it's Laura Storm that did uh, uh, regenerative leadership, which I have right here as well on on the on the bookshelf. Yeah. But um, uh, we pretty much have most most of the regenerative books and that that movement. And that it's not only a big fan, but I'm one of the the bigger fans of the past of ecological economics. So Herman yeah. Daly, Kenneth yeah. Boulding, um, yeah. you know. Uh, I like Buckminster Fuller a lot and a lot of his not economic models, but if we don't like the world, let's create a new model that makes the existing one obsolete in that respect. And, and so getting us out of this uh, machine view of the world and how the world works into more of one that's a regeneration and working in, uh, along with nature. This course that you're participating in, not only from your volans, but also, um, I guess, giving a section or a lecture is made up of eight weeks of different courses. And, and, you know, what is regenerative economics, thinking and systems, the eight principles of regenerative vitality, organizational design, macro regenerative economics, finance and service to life, learning to lead together, 
and a roadmap to transformation. I can uh, transformation sounds a little bit like Jeremy Lent or thinking in systems might be Jeremy Lent, who knows, but sounds absolutely fabulous, uh, this. And then uh, I mentioned as well, the, the other courses from uh, Laura Storm and Giles Hutchins, who wrote the, this book, Regenerative Leadership, they're doing another course where you're listed as well as many others. And I think their course is is also six modules, probably longer than six weeks, some, some physical, some online. Um, there's more and more of these courses, these opportunities to get this education, to get this, uh, this learning emerging every day. And I, I wanna know how do you feel about that? And how ha is it just because you've kind of been the front runner this whole time talking about these things that, that you get drawn into this or how do you, those people during the COVID who, who've uh, kind of woken up and had this awakening that says, hey, this world is not working for me anymore. And they're on this search. How do they, how do they find the right places to look and to get into these new models or making sense of the world? I think part of the answer is that certainly I was born nosy, so I'm constantly poking my nose into other people's business. Lara Storm I knew years ago through Sustainia, which is something that she did in uh, Denmark. Uh, Giles Hutchinson, who, who did the, 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 as you said, the, they put, did the book jointly. Um, we took our senior team down to spend a day with Giles and his woodland uh, and, 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 and that was actually profoundly useful but I'm going to say something that is that is not intended to be remotely critical I think what's going on in this regenerative space is phenomenally important I think it's the mulch from what a lot of other things will come uh, you mentioned um, some, some of the early ecological uh, economists I would add to that daily, people yeah. like yeah EF e Schumacher and so on there were yeah. there's some extraordinary talents but what we're involved in is a shift of paradigm. And, and, and Thomas Kuhn used to talk about real paradigm shifts taking about 70 to 80 years. And I think exactly. So I think I've got five copies of that in different parts of the, uh, the house. I found myself looking for them recently. And it's, it's had more of an impact on me than any other single Book, although I don't think it's particularly well written, but it, the, the idea at the heart is um, very, very powerful. But what, I, what I'm about to say is that the experimentation, the laboratories, the innovation that's happening with the people that we're talking about is absolutely crucial for what comes next. It's like in the early days of computing, personal computing, you had the homebrew computer club in, in, in San Francisco where everyone from all of the companies that would eventually form came together and just shared tricks and, 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 and so on. To some degree it happened in uh, music and, and, uh, as well. But I think where we are now is we've got a major crisis and the crisis that is in a way it doesn't really matter what all of us are doing in the regenerative space if the mainstream education system and business schools and so on do not wake up. So our small team at Mullins is spending a quite disproportionate uh, amount of its time now working with particularly business schools in different parts of the world, um, involving uh, their students, particularly masters and MBA students in projects that we're doing around uh, regeneration. Tomorrow, for example, I have a, a session in uh, Denmark, uh, well, virtually into Denmark, um, but with the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, we're working with them, but we're also working with the um, Japanese Shizenkan University, which is basically the new university saying they want to become a university for the 22nd century. That's a sort of level of ambition, which I think we need. It's, it's a sort of ambition you tend to find in the Schumacher College and so on, parts of the world, Finton or whatever. But as Valence, what we're trying to do is understand all of that, the good stuff that's happening, but then start to move some of that across into the uh, mainstream without doing violence, hopefully to the, the content that's being transferred, uh, ensuring that it's not just us 
capturing the language and then spreading it uh, as the missionaries. But actually, it's, it's a model I've always used with stakeholder engagement or whatever. Don't listen to us. Let us help you bring in, it might be Greenpeace, it might be Oxfam, it might be social entrepreneurs, it might be whatever it might be. Um, and again, that's what we're doing with the regenerators. We're trying to say, who's out there doing really good work? What is it that they need to be telling people in the mainstream of business and markets and so on? And how do we make that happen? So I think education is crucial, but it also is going to have to be backed up fairly quickly by working case studies of, of, of people trying the good stuff and some of it working and a lot of it, uh, le at least initially, not working and are having to learn very, very rapidly from all of that. But when we first spoke offline um, a year ago, we talked about, you know, uh, Thomas yeah. Kuhn's book, The uh, uh, um, Structure of Scientific Revolution. And it, you're absolutely right. It is a, it's, it's a hard read. It doesn't flow that, but it's also an older, older yeah. writing it's style. A different world. Yeah, it's a totally different world. And um, I love that as well. Today, I, and I, you know, I read a lot, but I am always looking for this, um, the meaning, this, the book, the kind of the culmination that brings it all together, the educational spot that you can go to that says, hey, there's a thousand academic books or a hundred academic books and, and even other books that are out there that we've kind of compiled into this regenerative model or this, this model that is pretty sound and structured. And, and you're in one of these courses for the regenerative uh, economy is with Jeremy Lent. He wrote The Web of Meaning. I don't know if, if uh, Lu, Lu, Luis spoke to him or not, or if you have, but just a fabulous book that really kind of brings it all together. Um, highly recommend it, but I'm just saying, are there other books that you know, because you're also well read, you're also out there kind of looking and learning and educating yourself in this process and the Volans team of regenerators. What other recommends do you have sources to go to of knowledge and wisdom that are that are bringing these these things that we weren't taught in school that, you know, aren't common knowledge uh, for those yeah. who are kind of awakening? Well, it's, it's difficult to um, recommend to other people what they might or might not read. I mean, our small offices in Somerset House in London are just stacked with bookshelves. But one of the things I noticed is that younger people, I, I, I still do, tend to buy a lot and read a lot of books, but younger people tend not to. And a lot of their information comes online. And therefore, I'm, I'm quite diffident about, about sort of pushing books as the answer to um any of these areas uh, of need. The Web of Meaning I bought years ago and, and skimmed, but didn't properly read it. And, and your encouragement is, is, is making me feel I should do that. But part of the reason is I buy so many books, I'm, I'm, I'm dipping into them um, and, and every so often one will strike and I'll go deep. But if, if, if I had to, um, this isn't the first time I've said it, but if, if I was trying to recommend to um, people in business of any age, what they should read. It wouldn't necessarily be the sort of books that we're discussing. I certainly wouldn't recommend Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions because it, it, it is such a headache uh, of a book. Um, but what I would very likely uh, recommend is science fiction. And I say that because, I mean, I started read science fiction in the, well, probably early 50s, but I mean, no, late 50s and early 60s, but um, have been very struck by the way in which science fiction as a field almost goes through these waves of being, to me at least, interesting and then becoming uh, less interesting. And, and, and going through the 90s, we moved away from sort of deep space travel and, and um, all that sort of stuff towards sort of more mutated president presence. I mean, I always think of William Gibson and his sense that the future is already here, just not evenly distributed. And, 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 and his stories, as you almost certainly know, uh, are that they're, they're disconcerting because they're today's world and yet they're not. Um, 
And so the future is sort of almost bellying into uh, our current reality. But what's happening at the moment is you've got a whole raft of science fiction authors, and including in China, some really interesting ones um, there too, looking at the realities of the world which we have been uh, creating for ourselves. And I, I was in Costa Rica about two weeks ago, uh, just trying to visit some of the regenerative projects uh, around the country. Um, and as I was traveling, I was, I was reading a book called The Water Knife. And it's, it's uh, about the southern states of uh, uh, the United States in a relatively close near-term future where water has become hideously scarce. You, you'll know that in, in the southern states at the moment that they're, they're enduring their worst drought for 1,200 years. Now, the thesis here is to some degree, it's not based on that evidence, but just saying, let's assume that that becomes the reality. What does that do? Well, the, 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 that book, The Water Knife, describes a world in which uh, civilization, as we know it, largely collapses. So, for example, Texas, Texans, become like Mexicans today, streaming across borders, trying to escape, being mercilessly treated as they, they sort of uh, try to get back to what is wh where water is found. Um, now, it's shocking. I mean, it's, it's one of the most visceral and violent books I've read for a very long time, but I, I, I think it serves the story. And there are people like Kim Stanley Robinson, who you know was um, at the Glasgow conference, one of the major speakers uh, there. Uh, talking. We were actually in Resilience Frontiers, a resiliency lab together and, and worked together. I uh, moderated one of the panels with him. I've got his yeah. book, Ministry for the Future here, and I highly recommend it. I think it's, well, I, I think it's brilliant, but I, I said to somebody not long ago that um, it looks like a novelized, uh, or it reads like a novelized MBA thesis. So, I mean, it's, it's getting a lot of good stuff across the readership, but in a, in a somewhat digestible uh, way. I don't think it's his liveliest novel, but it's, I think it's probably his most important. Uh, so very, very highly recommend that. So to your question, um, I, no, again, I don't push people towards science fiction or cli-fi, climate fiction or whatever, because you know who knows whether they'll like it or not, whether it'll put them off or uh, switch them on. But I find it incredibly helpful because it helps me imagine my way into the unimaginable spaces, which I think we're headed uh, towards. And that's not all bad. I mean, it, it, you know, as a entrepreneurial innovative species, we will make the best of what we uh, find ourselves um, delivered with. But I, I just find that sort of fiction really, really helpful. And, and um, books like American War, which is, uh, you know, most of us want fossil fuels to go. And the American war, as you probably know, it looks, it's out in the 2080s. And it just looks at a world where, um, you know, you pe people long to smell gasoline powered engines again, if they live in the South. Uh, and it's like the slavery um, uh, dynamic of the American civil war in the um, mid 19th century. You, you, it's a civil war again. But this time it's around energy and, and people are trying to get the South weaned off oil. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I just, I, I find, I find that sort of. Um, that brings up a unique fiction. question for me. Does that, does that, um, is that because as, as humanity, how quickly we tend to forget big history? I mean, you talked about the, the book on water and in that same area, Texas and, and, uh, and in the United States, there was actually a big era during uh, uh, um, FDR where there was yeah. huge dust bowls and, and major yeah. issues around yeah. uh, soil de degradation and things that uh, we turned around for a while. And then now we're yeah. really kind of back at that same point. Um, <clears throat> same thing with, you know, how quick we forget that even if we go back further to the invention of the automobile and production lines and Ford and however, where uh, very transformative, you know, at one point we were dealing with the, the big manure problem from horses and cows yeah. and pulling yeah. carts. And 
the unbelievable smells and the troubles there to then switch to to automobiles where nobody had a license. There was no roads, no infrastructures, no gas stations there. And um, a lot of troubles on that transition um, to get us there, we made it. But now, um, you know, I always, I always say, and I'd like to get your viewpoint or your thoughts on this. There's always this discussion about Americans that, you know, you can pry their guns out of their dead cold hands as they definitely don't want to get up, give up their guns. But I think there's a, a new uh, kind of a, a, an emerging topic is you can pry my car out of my dead cold butt, I guess, so to say, because they, everybody in America, I just got back from three months of being in America is really likes to drive and and loves their cars and loves the smell of gas and that and and uh the revving engines and the loud things and they'll drive to the mailbox if they could in in some respects where in europe where we live is is much it's a much different view on that not everybody has a car a lot of people take public transportation so how um do you think it's just we're forgetting that there could be a better transition or a better world and we're, we're driving to that. How, how, how are your feelings on that? Well, I wouldn't um, probably do what I've been doing in recent decades unless I felt that the situation was improvable, and I do. But I have a very peculiar mental model, and it is one in which, and it's, it's based on when I was at school, I, I spent a lot of time uh, going off piste or, or reading a history that wasn't set for me. And because I was raised in strange places like Northern Ireland or Cyprus or Israel, all of where, uh, all of which had conflicts going on in the 1950s, I read a great deal about civil wars and I read, read a great deal about religious wars, you know, in my early teens, mid teens. And what I learned from all of that is that there are rhythms, periodicities, cycles, uh, waves in our societies and economies. And then when I went to university first time around to do economics um, and studied the work of people like Kondratiev, Nikolai Kondratiev and Joseph Schumpeter, uh, both of whom were absolutely loathed by my uh, economics professors at the time in the 60s, um, what I, I reinforced that same sense. So where I think we are now, it's in a period of our collective history where the uh, international global order that we've grown up with dates back to the brilliant courage of, of politicians, particularly from the United States uh, in the Bretton Woods and Marshall Plan eras, and then sort of the rolling out of the UN institutions and so on. That's starting to unravel. Um, and you know, I, I've been saying this for quite some time and well before Putin started to do what he's doing. I don't think what he's doing is an aberration. I think it's it's almost an inevitable pushback against what started to happen. And then just to twist this slightly um, up towards pessimism, optimism. What gives me quite a lot of optimism is that it once would have been that you'd have a new set of technologies. It would be rice paddy farming 8,000 years ago, or it would have been, you know, the horse you mentioned, you know, the domestication of uh, the horse, or it would have been um, steam and steel and coal and all the rest of it, or it would have been chemicals and plastics and, and gasoline and the automobile and aerospace and so on. And, and now it's just everything. Everything's coming at the same time. And it's synthetic biology and it's artificial intelligence and it's novel materials and it's drones. And I just, the list goes on and on and on. Um, it's interesting when you look at most of those technologies used in the right way, they could all uh, bring a radical shrinkage of our problematic footprints. So for example, Rethink X, which is a group based in London and uh, the United States and Silicon Valley, um, have done a series of studies looking at different technologies. Just to take one, you, you were talking a moment ago about the car in the United States. I, I don't think there's any way that short of something radically different coming along, radically better, that people will be um, persuaded to, to, to abandon their cars. And yet, 
I think in some parts of the world, certainly in Europe, you're setting, neither of my daughters has a car, they're in their 40s. Uh, and, and there is this shift where younger people no longer need, if they live in cities or near cities, uh, to have cars. The point Rethink X were making was that if you look out into the 2030s and you look globally, what you what they see is a world in which um, the uh, revenues, for, I mean, sorry, the, the, the uh, mileage uh, or kilometerage covered by passengers around the world goes up 50% into the 2030s. But the, um, the revenues from all of that activity come down 70% because of new technology, because of new business models, because of, you know, it may not be Uber, but it may be somebody else entirely. But now, even if that's off by a, a couple of orders of magnitude, that's still a tr tr profound um, impact. And if you think just on the United States, where you've got, what is it, two to three million truckers driving these huge great sort of dual Steven Spielberg type, like sort of 18 wheelers or whatever, um, again, the prospect is within 50 to 20 years, pretty much all of those will be gone and be replaced by electric trucks. Now, what happens to all the people who are shaken out of those forms of employment? So <laughs> if, if, if you steer this in the right way, the outcomes could be environmentally, socially, governance uh, related in, in those areas, um, positive. But if you mishandle it, the, 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 the sort of repercussions could be profound uh, also. History suggests that we won't actually do it incredibly well much of the time, and therefore the repercussions will be profound. But I live in hope, and you know, I try and help people. Uh, I do too. <laughs> um, we we touched a little bit of, about models, and and I believe there are some telling tales of civilization frameworks or models. The way we've worked, and we're continuing to work uh, with those with regeneration regenerative economies yeah there's these new models emerging and um a lot of people uh, when you talk to them about it they're you know oh this is a buzzword this is new this is the new trend that everybody's jumping on and it's really kind of hard to grasp what these models are like i'm not sure if you're familiar with the organization called boundarylessio.io it's um, Simon Cicero and Luca Ruggeri. They created a fully open source me methodology that's very, pretty successful now. It's based off of platform business models and this platform design kit, which is really how most uh, software developer organizations, all the big ten top 10 companies run on a platform model. But there's an aspect uh, there that you can plug in regenerative ecosystem platform business models or models for life or models for civilizations that are very much in tune with the, the Lynn Margulis's and the symbiotic earth or, or with systems thinking from yeah. Fritz Hof Capra, complexity science. It's yeah. the systemic approach. Um, and they've already got 70,000 practitioners and a lot of organizations every day jumping on board to flip their model. And in that flip or in that shift, the SDGs are being plugged in, environmental social governance is being plugged into that entire model so that the triple bottom line is addressed in the three R's, you know, uh, uh, responsibility, resilience, and regeneration. I'd like to know what your feeling is on, on the shift from past uh, civilization frameworks that we've had that really have all, always failed and always been the same. They've always been hierarchy. They're not self-organizing. They're not circular. They're not regenerative. But yet we continue to, to go after that pursuit of those type of models. And what, what your thoughts, what you're seeing as, as a pioneer in, in the area on, on that? Well, the first thing to say is that um, the more platforms of the sort that you describe, boundaryless, it, the better. And and I haven't, I, I've heard of what they're doing. I haven't yet um, visited and now I've made a mental note to do um, exactly that. When I was doing that work off my own account, or on my own account, um, at school, looking at 
civil and, and religious wars. I also looked at the collapse of civilizations. It sounds as like though was a fairly merry child, um, but I was I was just genuinely interested in the pulsing of civilizations and what drove that. Um, and very often the religious and civil wars were symptomatic of other fracture lines in, in, in civilizations. So I was really riveted, I don't know, probably about 15 years ago, to read some of the diaries of some of the uh, Portuguese sailors who first went up the Amazon. And as you will know, they, they um, recorded uh, evidence of not only extraordinary civilizations, uh, which then largely disappeared as disease and so on ricocheted through. But they decide, they, they found extraordinary areas of fertility in the Amazon um, basin. And, and when that's been, those areas have been analyzed subsequently, it's all to do with charcoal and with um, organic content and so on being re-injected into the uh, soil in a, in a circular system. So for periods of time, our civilizations seem to be able to um, hold uh, the, the tensions between uh, creativity and evolution and collapse uh, for long enough for us to sort of breed a number of generations. Very often, um, the, 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 I think there's a, the, you, it, it was, I was reminded on uh, it with something you said earlier on, Mark, that um, there's an economist called, um, uh, who's known for the Minsky moment, the, 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 the point at which there is this profound, sudden and profound correction uh, in markets. And very often the principles that underlie underlying, uh, Minsky moments is that people forget what stability is and what it looks like and how you get to it. Uh, so in our economies, we have this boom and bust cycle. And the longer you go, and this was his point, uh, without a bust, the more likely it is you're gonna have one and it's gonna be a bigger one than you might otherwise have had. It's almost like a hydraulic model that has to settle out. I think Minsky moments also have no warfare in conflict uh, in the sense that and my parents were both involved in the Second World War. Um, they remembered what a real war was, what it was like. They also had some memory of what started it. Uh, and then over time, uh, you have a generation or two who don't have that experience. They don't care very much about war. They, they don't think very much about war until suddenly it presents. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing uh, at the moment. Now, whether that is a anti-fragility war where, you know, you think about um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb and his notion of things that don't kill you make you stronger to use the, the, the sort of proverbial way of stating it. I think what Putin is doing at the moment is clearly making some elements of our world stronger, but I think it's also uh, symptomatic of, a, of, of, a, of an era of Decay on the one hand, and he's pointing at the West as de decadent. I, I think Russia has many elements of that as well. But it's also of a new order beginning to sort of find its feet and assert itself. And in those conditions, talking about sustainability, talking about climate, talking about biodiversity, talking about soil loss, all of these sort of things suddenly becomes a bit more problematic. And I got, I got a session with a, a Scandinavian company's board later this week. I'm going to make the point that um, sustainability has often been seen to be a soft concept. It's about being nicer, about being better, it's about being more engaging, all that good stuff. Actually, it's about security. And security is one of the hardest, hardest edge, uh, edged uh, agendas that we face. Now, clearly defense is crucial, but energy security, food security, water security, all of these different elements, it's no accident that as you again, you know, the security forces and, and, and armies and navies and so on are increasingly exercised, concerned by what they're seeing in terms of the risk of climate change, destabilizing populations and driving huge numbers of people uh, to Europe or into uh, North America. So I, I'm actually optimistic, but from the 
base that suggests to me at least we've got an incredible 15 to 20 years to go through history is absolutely not ended everything's in play uh, and very different leadership is going to have to emerge our current leaders really aren't fit uh, for purpose in, in in most respects you discussed Caleb and his black swans, but also what you described, is that the, the U bend that you talk about a lot this moment kind of is? Well, the, it, it's in the book and it was just a simple yeah. uh, diagram. And it's partly based on these um, Kondratiev cycles. I don't believe that they're predictable, but I think there is an underlying rhythm. And it maybe it's every 50 to 70 years, you have one of these periods of massive, disinvestment from an old order and an investment in new orders very often you have then a shift of the geographical locus or focus of the global economy it's often gone west so for example it started off five thousand years ago in, in china and it went gradually to india and to the middle east and it went into eastern europe then it went to germany then it went to France and Britain, then it skipped the Atlantic, went to the East Coast of the United States and then the West Coast, and now it's gone to China again. And that's very crude, but there is there is something in there about um, this sort of itchy feet that, that, that sort of civilizations um, uh, often have. And I think we're at an extremely dangerous point in all of this for European uh, civilization, where it's extremely easy for us to look in inward and think we have a very particular history and therefore have special rights. Actually, I think we have special duties and responsibilities to the rest of the world. And we have a very narrow window in which to express them or to be, I don't know, I mean, I'm sounding a bit sort of Old Testament, but uh, run over by history. I, so I, you yeah. You speak a lot about getting away from, you know, incremental yes. movement growth is, is okay, but that we need to really get into systemic changes to some major transformation transformations and actually get up to speed with our exponentially growing world. And, and you know, we need to do some of these, these uh, corrections and transformations that are on an exponential pattern. They're impactful. In, in the book, you talk about not only green swans, but gray swans, blue swans, ugly ducklings, um, uh, you know, and obviously it, it's emerged from what you read from, from black swans and kind of this own um, answer to the recall of the triple bottom line. How do we come back with something that's really an awakening ed education moving forward? What is what is your biggest hope or takeaway when people read the green swans that they're getting out of it, that they're getting the re-imperatives, that they understand that there, there is some hope? I've heard you mention that the B Corp is kind of the ugly duckling and some could be the ugly duckling in some respects. Uh, do you want to describe that and kind of give us your hope or vision? Happily. I mean, I just very quickly on uh, all the different colors of swans, it's a bit like the different colors of hydrogen or, or whatever it happens to be. It's it's a bit muddling. Um, but the idea of a black swan is that it comes out of the blue and you don't see it coming. A gray swan is something that you do see coming. So uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb has been asked many times as to whether COVID-19 was a black swan. He says, absolutely not. We saw it coming. Government uh, inquiries and uh, investigations showed that we were actually uh, overdue for a, a pandemic and particularly a COVID uh, pandemic and that's what we um, uh, got. I mean the, the the blue ones are people are thinking about what, what can you do around water and ocean and so on. The idea of the green one was just simply it was a bright positive colour and, and um, if, and I'm going to do violence to Taleb's thinking to some degree, if black swans are largely going to take us, at least initially, exponentially where we do not want to go, what would it be like if you could create the conditions uh, in which um, uh, reality could take us exponentially where we do want to go? Um, and so you might, for example, think of something like fusion power. 
endlessly predicted 50 years in the future, 30 years in the future, whatever. But what if it suddenly uh, erupted? That, well, that, that could both be uh, a green swan in terms of energy, in the sense that it's exponentially uh, unleashing clean, relatively clean power. But I remember Amory Lovins, um, Rocky Mountain Institute, probably 30, 35 years ago, saying the worst thing that we could do would be to have clean, cheap energy. Hunter and Capital, Hunter, yeah. yeah, Hunter and Avery. Uh, well, I, I, what he did, and uh, Paul and Hunter there, I, I, I loved. Um, but even earlier, he was saying um, it, the, the worst thing would be if you had abundant, uh, clean uh, and, and, and free energy, because it would be, you'd use energy in all of the inappropriate ways. It'd be like using, as he put it, a chainsaw to cut butter. Um, uh, and so, you know, whatever we do as a species, there are always unintended consequences. And one of the institutions that I really admire immensely historically was the US Office, Office of Technology Assessment, OTA, which was shut down after it done something like 700 studies. But we really, really, really need a global um, version of the OTA, which can actually scrutinize uh, these new technologies, engage the people developing them, track them as they do what they do, um, and, and, and inform regulators and policymakers and so on about how they're best controlled and, and where where there are positive benefits, those how those might be best um, incentivized. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, um, I, I find the swans help me, but and the ugly ducklings, just the, 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 the idea there simply is just as in Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, um, the, 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 the ugly duckling looks ridiculous. It looks weird. It looks like nothing we've ever seen before. And yet it may contain the answers to some of our most urgent questions if we just pay enough attention and support it in the right uh, way. Absolutely love that. You know, when I've heard you speak, I've followed your work uh, for, for many years. It's just a sheer pleasure to, to exchange ideas and to hear uh, what you're working on and what you've brought to the world. It's really nice to hear how you speak about the sustainable development goals because you say it's a it's a, a seismic shift in business it's a it's an exponential change change goals is probably what they should have called them that they are tied together in systems and you really talk positively about them most people don't even know what the sdgs are they've never heard of them they're like what, what are those? Who are they for? Cities, countries, governments, you know, how, for, are they for business? They're for us as individual. They're like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They're uh, a reflection of the basic needs that we need to, to raise the bar for humanity and say, you know, we're, we're going to raise the bar to this level and never let humanity get below that level again. And it's this push towards what is development. It's, uh, commercial and residential, but what is sustainable development is creating that infrastructure of the future, that solid base to then springboard off into those R imperatives, those endless re-imperatives that, that, that you mentioned. So responsibility, resilience, regeneration, how do we be prepared along with our exponentially growing world to be ready for those futures? And I, and, and um, I love that. Uh, for the UN, I wrote this Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto to give people a vision of what it would feel like to be standing December 2030 in a world that had achieved them all, um, because I don't think we have enough stories, never, narratives, or media that really gives us a vision. Why do we want to achieve a goal if we don't even know it exists or don't understand what it would feel like or what it would mean to us to be standing in a world like that? And so I wrote the manifesto for that specific reason but i just i wanted to thank you if anything to to say thanks for all your great work uh, uh and speaking positively about the sustainable development goals no matter all the negativity that we've maybe heard lately about them i i think they are a a, a singular achievement in the sense that so many people came together and probably what was one of the biggest democratic 
expressions of hope for the future and, and ideas about how a better future might be uh, delivered and guided. So in that sense, I, I, I absolutely support them. I, I have a slight concern in the business world where uh, companies I've seen engage the goals have tended to say, what are we already doing? How does that map onto the, the goals? Oh, good, we got four or five, you know, maybe even six. Um, uh, that's great. That's, you know, for them, that's almost the end of the story. Whereas I think it's only the beginning of the story. And it, one of the things that just flashed through my brain a moment ago was um, probably over 10 years ago, I was working with a supply chain organization uh, called Two Degrees. And um, they, they were talking about big solutions uh, to problems. And I said, it's a bit like waiting for Alexander to stride in with his sword and cut through the Gordian knot was maybe what we need is an absolute storm of razor blades. Just going in and, 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 and starting to tackle um, uh, problems all over the place, somewhat independently, but underneath a sort of an overarching uh, blueprint, roadmap, manifesto, whatever. Uh, and and, and the, the person I did it uh, for that work keeps repeating that back to him, it's stuck in his, uh, memory but i really do think there is something about that that there will be these major strokes that people can take but um a lot of this is going to have to be done on the fly in the local environment uh without totally knowing whether it's going to work or not um and that's again why i think reporting back to other people about what you're trying what has worked what hasn't where you need help all of that's incredibly important so mark thank you very much for the work that you do um and, and for the conversation today yeah the, the i i really appreciate you and and it, there's no no thanks needed i gladly do it i've run into the exact same thing that you've run into where uh, this this kind of skepticism on business where they are writing their annual report at the end of the year and then they look back and they say what did we do this past year that we can fit into certain sdgs yeah well, isn't that a sad way to do it? Where if they started out at the beginning of the year and say, hey, let's have some actions, campaigns and goals around all of the SDGs or quite a few of them that we can address and report on our achievements and on our success. Then we've actually done something. If they go back casting, so to say, and say, hey, what did we do this year that fits to the SDGs? Nothing ever happened. And so, so that's something great. I'm glad, I'm glad you really brought that up. The last question I have for you, and then I'll, I'll let you go, um, is really the hardest question I have. It, it's, an, it's a question of what does a world that works for everyone look like for John Elkington, look like for you? Um, I, it, it has a lot of laughter in it. Um, it smells good. Uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't bad smells, but but you know, I, if, if you move into a, an ecosystem that is healthy, you can smell it, uh, and it actually influences your your health. Um, it won't be without challenges. As a species, we need challenges; otherwise, we go we grow bored and grow grow useless. Um, so, I, I it, we need to be. Um, challenged. I, I, I think it's it has to be a world that takes the futures uh, and the future health and well-being of its youngest uh, members very, very seriously indeed. A lot, lot of tribal peoples had elements of that. Uh, there have been different experiments over the years, but we haven't really properly engaged that, I don't think. And it will be an, a world in which learning comes naturally um, to everyone. Uh, and the, the the ability to learn uh, in terms of accessing uh, knowledge and all the rest of it is it'll never be evenly spread, but but much more evenly spread and accessible than it currently um, is. And I think fundamentally, people will have hope, hope for the future in a way that they once, perhaps in a rather more naive way did during the sort of Victorian era in the United Kingdom and Europe and then the United States and Japan and so on. They felt the, the world was going to improve. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like it to be better founded, but I, to me, that would be a symptom of um, the sort of world I'd like to see. 
But the laughter to me is key. If, if, if people are laughing, uh, that's a good sign. That's still beautiful. John, thank you for Green Swans. Thank you for everything. Thanks for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. And I hope we our paths cross again. I know you're still got plenty of work to do, and I'm looking forward to following it. Have a wonderful you. evening. You too, Mark. And I just I was just thinking as the swans on the cover are taking off, they're probably cackling, but they're probably not cackling in the way that I would like them to do. But it, it's yeah. been a joy and uh, look forward to a continued conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.